Thank you so much for joining me in this live broadcast of Dynamic Web Church. I know that you're going to be blessed and impacted by this message of God's grace. The focus on Dynamic Web Church and on this website and Grace Stream TV, everything is to have the message of grace as the center point and the focus from where we have everything. We speak on in the area of finances, um, in the area of uh, just interpreting scripture, everything is the cross and what Jesus Christ has done for us and how that applies to our lives. So I want to welcome all the first-time viewers. If you're a first-time viewer to Dynamic Web Church or Grace Stream TV, I want to welcome you. Sit back, relax, enjoy the message of God's unconditional love. And as we speak, let this message touch your heart. As you feel the persuasion of this truth come to your life, just give over to what God says. Amen. Today we're going to talk about um, being born of God and, and what it means. Uh, on, on the blog that I have or the forum that I have, there are many discussions about being born of God or what it means to be born of God. Um, and there, there's, a, there's a teaching of um, ultimate reconciliation and all those type of things, which is confusing, which doesn't, it's not confusing when you listen to it, but when you read the scriptures, it's confusing. When you read the Bible, it's confusing because it's con it contradicts the scriptures. It contradicts what's written um, in the Bible. And then one becomes tired. It just brings this, this, this heaviness, this thing of God. I don't know, um, you know, how should, what should I make with this scripture? What should I do with this? So today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach a little bit on that, what it is to be born of God, what does it mean to be have to have one new man? What does it mean that Jesus Christ has included the whole world in his death, burial, and resurrection? What does all of those things mean, and how should we see it, and what light should we see it? Before we get into anything, let us just pray together, then I'm going to give you a quick report back on the uh, the outreach we've had or the conference we've had in um, Kenya in Nairobi. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you that I can preach this gospel, share the testimonies of what has happened in Nairobi. Thank you, God, for every person that is watching this right now. I trust and believe that they will be touched deeply by your message of grace. Holy Spirit, thank you that you've empowered me to preach and understand this gospel in such a way that many can believe your unconditional love. Thank you that you've done it for all of us. Thank you that you love us so much. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't exclude one man in your sacrifice, but that you paid the sin for the, you died for the sins of the whole world. Thank you that you've empowered me to preach this in a powerful way. Amen. Amen. I want to say thank you to every person that prayed for us on this trip where we went to Kenya and in Nairobi, the, which is the capital of Kenya. Um, we've had a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, I've been invited to go and preach in a conference. It was quite a large conference with about a thousand plus people in the conference in Nairobi. Pastor Ken and his wife, Mercy, invited me. They were the hosts of the conference. If you want to see some pictures, you can just become a friend on Facebook. Or if you're already my friend on Facebook, you can see under Barty Brits. Just search for Barty Brits on Facebook. Ask to become a friend. Or if you're already a friend on Facebook, I've already uploaded pictures of Nairobi and the conference there, but I didn't write anything um, about what we've done, so I would like to just give a quick report back. We arrived in Nairobi, um, and with such an excite, su such excitement to go and preach in this conference. From the first day, from the word go, it was awesome. We could just come and preach the gospel of grace, and we weren't persecuted for it. Although a lot of the preachers that preached there, the focus was not the love of God or the grace of God, but maybe a lot of what you must do for God or, or how much you must pray or anything like that. But the, we weren't pushed away. We were allowed to preach the gospel. People got touched. I tell you, um, we even see people got healed. People got uh, touched by the Holy Spirit. And the greatest thing of all is we saw leaders really grabbing a hold of this gospel of grace. God has also opened great doors for me in Tanzania, Kenya, and also even into Uganda and Malawi. So um, I've met with a, with a pastor there that's got like 2,000 churches just in Kenya, and that is open for me to come and preach in his church and to have conferences with him. 
Uh, then I've also met with, a, with an evangelist from um, Tanzania. His father's also got over a thousand churches in Tanzania. Uh, and he's well known and he invited me to come and do some crusades with him. So I'll be going to Tanzania then in October, November. We'll finalize the dates and we'll let you know. And then I'll, be, I'll, be go, I'll go and do some crusades there. What's nice about it is I only have to pay the plane ticket and basic traveling costs in Nairobi, uh, in um, Tanzania, but the costs for the crusades, the advertisement on television, the choirs, the singers, the sound systems, the stages, everything is paid by them. So it's really people working together and God has linked us up in a wonderful, wonderful way. So for those people that have prayed, prayed for me that we must have favor and uh, that the gospel can be spread in, that, in those nations, God has answered your prayer and it is happening. So I'm very, very excited about that. I've also preached in a conference in Johannesburg with Safe Harbor, Pastor Alan Spiegel, and some other ministers from the United States. It went so, so well. I tell you, I came back from that conference, um, from both conferences. I mean, we've been busy day and night, basically. Um, I came back, I was very, very tired, but so, so excited um, with this message of grace. I tell you, when, uh, especially when Arthur Mankis ministered, Pastor Allen ministered, it was so powerful. You know, we could just see this excitement just f flooding the air. Ron Allen ministered. It was so beautiful. Steve Willifield, he, he, um, we will upload this whole conference on Grace Dream TV anyway. Um, we just got the tapes. It's, it, unfortunately, it's an NTSC format, and um, it's quite a process now to get it to Pell so that we can upload it. Um, but the whole conference will be uploaded for you guys. It was so, so awesome. It was such a blessing. Uh, Steve spoke about um, the woman, uh, you know, Martha and Mary. And, and Martha was troubled by much serving. And you know when he said that way, troubled by much serving. And Mary chose the better part, which was to sit at the feet of Jesus. And when he said that, God spoke to my heart and said, you know, to sit at the feet of Jesus means to rest at the walk of Christ on your behalf. To rest at his, his walk on behalf of you and not to be troubled by much serving. Many times we think much serving is what gives us blessings before God, but the Bible calls that to be troubled. <laughs> Amen. So it was just an awesome, awesome conference. I've also been invited again to go to the United States and preach in the conference, um, the Safe Harbor Conference in February. And for you people that are in the States, I'll be in February, March, um, I will be in the United States. I'll also be going up to Canada. Everything working out well. So um, please look at the, at the itinerary we've got. We will upload it. It will be on our forum um, where you can see the, my whole itinerary, where we will be, when, what pastor, contact details, everything. So if you want to come to one of the conferences, that you can come and be part of where I'll be ministering. I'm so excited to see how this message of grace is just spreading all over the world. And how God has given us favor, not with God only, but also with man. Amen. So, um, thank you for those that prayed. If you want to continue to pray for us, please do so. Pray that utterance will be given us. That we can speak in such a way that many can believe. You know, if we can speak to one man... We get, there, there are key people out there in this world. The one guy that invited me to his church, he was, the, he was the advisor to the president of Kenya. So it is awesome to know that God can open churches in such a way. These are people with uh, 8,000 members, 8,000 seater auditoriums, churches. They fill it up four times on a Sunday morning. You know, it's, it's people that has got a platform where the gospel can really make an impact. Now, I'm not saying that it is a greater miracle to, sp to speak before thousands than to speak to one because it's the same gospel and the same power that will get one man to believe is to get millions to believe. In the, it's the same power. So in the same way, like Paul said, pray for us that a door will be given us, that a way will open, that, that we can see God is leading us here or God is leading us there. Thank you so much for that. Those of you that supported this um, Thank you for that. The person that bought the plane ticket for me to go to, to, uh, to, to Kenya. Thank you so much for doing that. Amen. God's blessing rests upon you all. Hallelujah. Um, before we get into the word, I want to just say something short about finances. Let's quickly go to Rome, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 
2 Corinthians chapter 8. The Bible says, let us give our members, present our members unto God. You know, so many times when we were, uh, when we were unsaved, when we haven't believed in Jesus Christ, we, cannot, we did present our members unto unrighteousness. And we were enslaved in unrighteousness. We were enslaved in fearing when it comes to money. Fearing when it comes to um, eternal life. Fearing when it comes to the judgment of God. We've given our lives to being stingy. We've given our lives to, um, to sin and adultery and fornication and, and stealing and bad thoughts. And We've given our lives. We've made our lives available for that. So when you're in the world, if you, if you can remember that, some of us have been saved for such a long time, we can't even remember how it functioned. But Paul wrote it down in Romans. You know, he, he clearly said that there was a time when we did not believe in Jesus. When you did not believe in Jesus, you gave over to the passions that was in your heart. When you were under the law, not seeking God, there was passions inside your heart that started to work. It says, man, let's rob this person. Let's, let's steal this money. Let's be, um, how can I say, not open about the taxes and, and all those things. And, and we fell in that. So we had the desire and the passion and then the desire and the passion, we made our bodies available for that, for service unto that. In the same way, the Bible says that let's make our bodies now available for God so that we can, um, so that He can have a place wherein He can manifest Himself. The only place where God can manifest Himself is in your body. It's in your actions. Amen. In your body, He will manifest Himself self in a way called immortality and the salvation of your body. Um, and then in deeds, in, in your deeds and in your mind, in your thought pattern, He manifests Himself through deeds of compassion that you show towards people, love for each other. Like the Bible says, He that is born of God will love his neighbor. Now the focus here is not you must love your neighbor. The focus is simply like this. God lives in you. When He comes in, into your life, there's a passion and a desire inside your heart that comes towards, let's do good to this person. Let's love this person. Let's be kind to that person. Let's, let's speak good of this one. Um, let's give. Let's love. All those things, it comes to our heart. And now it says, give now your members. Give your body. To those things that already exist inside you. Hallelujah. So, um, and, and you've heard that I've spoken for a year and a half, two years. All that I've preached on was how God gave to you. How God gave to you. And that, if you go and look at the, the writings of Paul, especially Ephesians, Galatians, you will find that the first two, three chapters only speaks of what God has done for you. And then the last chapters speaks of how we open ourselves up to the working of God in our lives in the form of good works. Galatians chapter 4 says, if you have crucified the flesh, you've crucified it with its passions and its lusts manifesting in your life. So you can now live a holy life. So when we talk about the grace of God, we are not running away from the manifestation of grace the manifestation of life in our lives. Because that will bring so much frustration to our life. One of the most frustrating things is if we could believe in Jesus, believe we are righteous, but never see any righteousness in our life. Always feel angry. Always fighting. Always quarreling. Always bearing hatred. Always fearing. Always thinking bad. Always swearing and cussing. Doing all those type of things. So when you do those things, it is such a contradiction to what is really in your life and, and the truth because we are not making this available to God. So in your heart, when it comes to this gospel, in your mind, see that you've given your life over. You even give your deeds, your works, your, your, your finances, everything, you give it over to God. And... Um, I've seen when I was at the conference now, when they would take up an offering, 
you can see that the, w when that basket comes past, now I, I don't even do that in my church. I don't send a basket past people that they can give money. If they want to give at the door, there's something, or on a table, they can go and put it there if they feel free. Um, but if I just look at the hearts of people, it's when that basket comes, all of a sudden you'll find somebody pick up their Bible and read, you know. And then um, when the basket goes, is passed, then they put the Bible down again. Because of guilt that is inside one's heart. So we should not live in guilt in any way. If we, you know, if, if, you, if you are free in the gospel of grace and you don't want to give, you will not feel guilty at all. And if you want to give, you will do it because there's no fear in your heart. So all I want to say to you when it comes to finances, maybe not even of Dynamic Web Church, maybe you don't even give anything towards this ministry, that is fine. Go to your church, but open your heart for the working of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit works in you to love, He works in you to give. So when the Holy Spirit comes and He works that passion inside your heart, give, yield your members to Him. Let Him do it. You know, because that's where guilt and all condemnation comes in all the time. You know that God works this thing in you. You reject it, you refuse it, and then you start to feel guilty. Now, God, if, even if you reject the working, you know, that you should do something or love somebody or give something, God's not going to send you to hell for not doing that. And you don't have to feel guilty for years because of that. But there's been, what, what I've seen is with a misunderstanding of the gospel, you know, we find, like the one person wrote on his blog, I, I didn't write that, he find that people doesn't want to come to church anymore. They don't want to, because all they've had in all their life is, church is a law, and I'm not going to go to church, because church is this law. But the benefit of going to church, if the gospel, I want to say this, if the gospel of grace is preached and not law, is wonderful, for it keeps your mind into the truth of the gospel. It keeps you pure. I look at this at this um, this conference I've been in. I tell you, uh, it is awesome to hear the gospel of grace every day, all the time, and to talk about it all the time. In this last conference I've been in, I mean, every preacher that only speaks grace, when we talk to each other during the sessions, we only speak grace. It is such a fellowship in grace that all fear disappears, if there could be any fear. That all that is that holds us down, it just disappears because God has come and set us free and our minds are being renewed in this. In the same way, you know, um, and I want to read 2 Corinthians 8 verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, we do to wit of the grace of God bestowed upon the churches in Macedonia, how that in great trial of their affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto, unto the riches of their liberty. So listen to what he says here. It, it's written in a difficult English, um, uh, uh, but this is, this is also wonderful. Listen, uh, just by the way, uh, I love the King James translation, but the English Standard Version is also a very, very good translation of the original text. So if you can get a hold of an English Standard Version, get a hold of that, or what they call the New American Standard Version. Very, very good uh, translations. The, uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, the New American uh, Standard Version is seen as the most accurate on the Internet. I'm, I, I did a search on what is the most accurate translation, and they said any s Greek scholar will tell you that, that that is even better than the King James. Well, anyway, um, that was just for, interesting, for interest's sake. It says here, it's written a bit difficult, but I'm going to explain this. It says, Now that in great trial and aff trial of affliction and abundance of their joy and their poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberty. So what it was saying here is, these guys were very poor. But the poorer they were, the greater we could see the liberty wherein they live. It's almost like this. The darker the night, the brighter the light. Now, God didn't bring darkness to shine forth His light brighter. It just, God gave the light. But when the situation was difficult, we could see the brightness of the light and the focus could be upon the light. These people were really poor. And out of their poverty, we, the grace of God even made them to be givers. So they were so free from this, their situation they were so free from their 
their, their, uh, um, this, what, what happened to them in this world, in the physical and in the flesh, they didn't even take that into consideration. What they took into consideration was the power of the Holy Spirit that was within them, and they gave and contributed, this is the church in Macedonia, to the poor churches in Jerusalem. And to the point that Paul came and he said, listen man, what has happened here in Macedonia, where we could see the grace of God, that even if these people were poor, they were so set free from finances that they could just live in abundance of giving. Now, I, I don't say give your bread money. You know, there are preachers that say that, give your bread. I'm not saying that. All that I'm saying is that the working of the Spirit is powerful. And it has liberated you to do what you really want to do. So when it comes to finances, you don't have to work yourself up with a promise of money that's going to come if you pay a tithe, if you sow, or anything like that. What works in our hearts is the very nature of God that stands for generosity and kindness towards people. So when you feel that, um, even if it's, I'm not saying you must give to this ministry. I'm talking about your church because there are people of different churches in the grace-based church. Go and give. Allow the working of God in your life and see how God lives in you. Let's yield our members to God. You know, um, b because, and I, even with, for me to speak about this is not easy, it's difficult. Because of the wrong concept that there's always been about works. Works has always been the thing that you had to do for God to bless you. And that now, whenever we speak about works, gives you a bad remembrance. There's a bad taste in our mouth when we hear about good works, good works, good works. But what Paul says in Ephesians, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. It says here, <laughs> For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has beforehand ordained that we should walk in them. So giving and love and all those things fit you the way a glove fits a hand. You are made for it. The, 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 the good works were made, then you were made to fit into these good works, and you were created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Hallelujah. And what I've said is, in, in the conference as well, is what I've seen the church do is they take the power of the Holy Spirit to meet the needs and the requirement that is placed by the worldly standards in what you must wear, where you must stay, what you must drive, and how you must handle your finances. We're not going to take the power of the Holy Spirit to meet the worldly standards. Many of us, we are happy with what we have. We are happy with where we stay. We are even happy with the income we have. But because of the worldly standard that is forced upon us through television and the media and friends, we are scared to live what is the true unction inside our hearts. So, um, I'm not making you a promise saying that if you give, God's going to bless you. All I'm saying is that God has blessed you. What you have is what God has given you. And when it comes to giving, open your heart to what you know you really are. Hallelujah. And live and make your members available unto God. Thank you, Jesus, for that. I would like to pray for everybody right now that um, concerning finances. Father, I want to thank you that I can pray for people right now that where, when it comes to their money, I thank you for giving them wisdom and understanding in your scriptures and in your word. I thank you, Lord, for the freedom that there can be upon people right now. Hallelujah. There are people that are blessed financially, but they are scared to give. And God wants to set you free from that fear. You don't have to live in that fear. You can be a giver, for that is what God has made you to be. You can give to your church. You can give to somebody in the street. You, maybe God has spoken to you to buy somebody a house or a car that you know. 
a, a friend's son maybe or a friend's daughter or, or to help another, somebody else to put their children through university or th something like that. But you're scared, although you are very wealthy. In the name of Jesus, I remove that fear from you right now in Jesus' mighty name. And I declare you prosperous in your mind when it comes to giving and God's nature inside you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Isn't it wonderful that we can preach such a well-balanced message? Because the gospel of Jesus is not just a theory. It is something that is active in the lives of us all. And we can live in this. Thank you, Jesus. We can be set free. Hallelujah. You know, when I travel and we go around the world, um, you know, there are many things that I see. I see people that are in great poverty. and I see people that are very, very rich. Um, in the same country, when I was now in, in, in um, Kenya, you know, there are people that are literally billionaires. And then there are people that live in the swamps of Nairobi that I can't describe to you how those people live. I think it is, it is the, it must be some of the poorest situations in the world. It looks like Kolkata. It looks, it, it is the real swamps. People have got sores on their bodies. The, the, the sewer runs down in between the houses. There's no roads. It is something you cannot imagine. And the people out of the swamps there, uh, now I say swamps, <laughs> slums, out of the slums there came and, and they built a massive church there. It, and that to me is just a sign of the liberty that Christ has given them. They built this massive church, you know, that can see 2,000 people um, and that didn't come out of money those people I spoke to a, 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 a pastor there the one that's got the thousands of people in his church and all of that money they've planted churches in South Africa and South Africa to me is, is more there's more of a first world part here than a third world part it's, it's really well developed um, in, 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 in the infrastructure and I saw that pastor from Kenya and the people in the, in, the, in the shacks there went and sent money to people in South Africa and they've planted many churches here in South Africa with money that comes from the slums. It's amazing what God can do. It's amazing the liberty that, a person, that, that, that God can give a person. Hallelujah. So if you are scared, go to God. Receive his unconditional love that He will always care for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Right, let's get into the word that I've got for today. I want to just ask my wife if you can get me a glass of water, please. Um, thank you, Elena. Uh, so, yes, we've had a wonderful time. If you want to watch that again, go on to Facebook. You can see some of the pictures there. I'll be going again in... in, in um, in October, thank you for those, those people that are in the States and Canada. Next year I will be there. I'm really looking forward to that. I'll also be in New Jersey. Um, it's it's going to be awesome. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Right, let's go to uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 15. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 15 and John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I'm going to go to John chapter 1 and John chapter 3. Speaking about being born of God, what it means to be born of God. Um, you know, if we say, and I say this with all my all the love in my heart, that the whole world has been born again, we are, and and we, but, and what we mean by that is, well, every person is being made new in Jesus, and therefore has the ability to believe in God. Um, it is wonderful and true, you know that. In the sense that every body has got the ability to, 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 to receive what Jesus Christ has done and understand it. But in a wrong way of seeing the scriptures, and we say that everybody is born again, and everybody is saved, we are missing it. Because you can read this one scripture in John chapter 1, um, and I think it's verse 8. It says, let's read verse 8, and he was not that light, uh, sorry, verse 9, that that was the true light which lighteneth every man that comes into the world. It, verse 8, He was not that light, talk about John the Baptist, but was sent to bear witness of that light, 
that was the true light which lighteneth every man that comes into the world. Thank you so much. Amen. So there's a script that says that God enlightens every man that comes into the world. And now we sit with this thing, every man is enlightened. So, um, and which we know, it is not the truth. Every man is not enlightened in the word of God. It, it just open your eyes, look around, and you will see there are some people that are enlightened and some people that are alienated from God because of not understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if we take that scripture, which sounds so good because it says, well, nobody has to believe, everybody is already enlightened by God, the Holy Spirit has given birth to every person, then, uh, you know, it, it sounds so good. But it is actually so bad because when we do that, we must say that this Bible, you know, does not contain the Word of God in every scripture. Then we must say that we can only read four or five pages of this book and not every page. And we need to twist and change scriptures in the Bible, which, um, I mean, uh, let, let me give you an example. Here we read verse, verse 8 and 9. He was a true light. There it is. On the very same page, it says, um, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Okay, and then it goes on and it says in chapter 3, just a little bit further, it says, this is condemnation. That light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light. So here it clearly says is that there is a light that has come unto all the world. There are those that have to come to the light in order to be enlightened. That's what it says in chapter 3. So now, if we say everybody's enlightened, now we must change chapter 3. And there's such a contradiction in the Word of God. And wherever we go, and it just brings forth quarrels. It brings forth fighting in the body of Christ. I've even seen on my own forum, where, where the, you will find three or four people becomes the only people that talk. Because, and type on the forum, because... Others feel the contradiction. They can see that this is just quarreling. And it doesn't make sense. Because whatever we say, we have to twist, to add, and to, and, and, and to fit into something that is not there. So, I just want to give my opinion here uh, clear. I don't believe everybody is saved. And I don't believe that everybody is born again, because there's no such a scripture in the Bible. You have to twist things to say that everybody is saved. You have to twist things to say that everybody is born again. I'm going to explain to you the closest point that we can get to, to say that everybody is born again, and that a new man was formed and made. And we find that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. Let's go there. And if we misunderstand the scripture, um, we, we, will, we will be in great trouble. You know, there's also a scripture in the Bible that says Jesus Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. Now, I want to say this. There, there, there are five translations on my, um, on my computer that does not state that. That says that, the, that, that our names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and there are those that's, written, that's names weren't written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world, um, and says, and that Jesus was slain. Other translation says that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. Other says the names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world in the Lamb that was slain. So it doesn't say. Um, you know, this, and, and I even looked at the Greek, schol Greek scholars in the studies, is they, there's, a, there's an argument between the people. The one says that the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. The other says it, does, it, it, it is not like that. Now, to me, the greatest proof that Jesus was not slain before the foundation of the world was because He was slain 2,000 years ago. If Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world, why was it needful for Him to be crucified now? 
um, uh, uh, you know, if we say he was, he was slain before the foundation of the world, then we must say that he was found, that we were found in Christ before we were lost in Adam. So how can we be lost in Adam if we were found in Christ? It doesn't make sense. It's just a nice slogan, but it doesn't have any power. The truth of the gospel is that God, before the foundation of the world, had in mind that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love, in Christ Jesus, which existed before the foundation of the world, not in bodily form, because He received His body in Mary. And that is the truth of the gospel, truth of the, of the Bible. And we need to stick to that. Then Jesus, went, He existed. He was called the tree of life. Planted in the garden. Then Adam had to partake of the tree of life so that he will forever be before God alive in his body. That was the, what the Bible also says, that the promise that was made before the foundation of the world, which was that we will have immortality, will then be. So there was a promise from the beginning that man will have immortality in Jesus Christ. Now, he was not called Jesus Christ then. He was called the tree of life or the word or the concept or the mind of God. Then Adam sinned and God said, my concept still is that man will be blameless before me. And then he came, became a human being and died for us so that whosoever believe might be saved. And that is the gospel, my friend. And to change the simplicity of the gospel will only bring confusion and strife to the church. It makes it foolish to evangelize. It makes it foolish to preach the gospel. Um, you know, I want to say this to you. If Paul used certain words in the Bible with your doctrine that you believe, can you use the same words like what Paul used when he said in John chapter 3, um, verse 9, uh, uh, not Paul, John, John, the Apostle John, he said, there are those that are of their father the devil. Now, do you think that there are people that are not born of the devil? There are people today, and I'm not talking about their physical bodies, all of us are the possession of God. But what they do and the life that lives in them is they live in rejecting Jesus is not born of God, but it's born of Satan. Jesus said to the Pharisees, which were created by God, whom he came to die for, you are of your father Satan. So we, and, and I'm not here to, 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 to um, promote the work of Satan. All I'm here is to say how things are today so that we don't confuse scriptures especially if you're a preacher. We cannot stand up in, in front of people in, um, in a conference where there's 5,000 people on a public platform like what I'm using here and say, everybody is born again. And then when somebody stands up in the crowd and asks a question, you're going to look like a fool because you're contradicting Scripture. You're contradicting the gospel of Jesus. You're contradicting the redemptive plan of God where he redeemed us unto who Jesus was and is, which is a believer. The righteous or the just shall live by faith. Finished. That is what scripture says. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, let's go to Ephesians that I said there, chapter 2, and we're going to read from verse 15. Let's read from verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off, were made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now, listen to this. He talks about people that has been far off. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the, the, the Gentiles. Let's start in verse 11 and let me explain this. He says, Wherefore, remember that you being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hand. So what he's saying here is, you were called Gentiles, you were afar off, you were called Gentiles by whom? By the circumcision, which, were the, which are the Jewish people. That at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. So at that time, they were there was no salvation for the, for the Gentiles. And strangers from the covenant of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So the Gentiles were without God 
in the world. That's what it says. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So, what does he t talk about here? He says there are two nations, the Jews and the Gentiles. And now these were far from God because they didn't have the law. And the promises weren't concerning them, but concerning those who obey the law. But now in Christ, they were brought nigh. How? How were they? For he is our peace who has made both one. What is this both one? It's not God and man. It is the two types of people. The Jewish people and the Gentiles. He's made the two now one. And has broken down the middle wall of separation between us. So there was a separation between the Gentiles and the Jews. That was broken off by one man. The separation is not God and man. The separation is man and man. And so many times we read that wrong and say that there was a separation between us and God because of the law and God came and fulfilled the law. Now there's no more separation between us and God. No. The context in, in, in Ephesians here is the separation between the Jewish people and the Gentiles. And that separation was the law. Because the Gentiles did not have the law. And the law was what brought the separation. Now it says in verse 15, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for, it make, uh, for to make in himself the twine one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And come and preach peace to you which are afar off and to them which are nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the God, in whom you also are built together for the habitation of God through the Spirit. So what he's saying here is, he says that he has made the two one. And if you go and read in Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 1, it talks about the people having faith. It says here that, um, for by grace are you saved through faith. So, it says, by grace are you saved through faith. And now we've been made partakers of the kingdom. So don't let the Jewish people now come and tell you, you are far from God. No, God made both one new man. So before God, there is no more Jew and Gentile, free or slave. Just one, one man, the man that by faith has got access into the grace of God and without faith has got access into eternal condemnation and hell. There's only one man. God does not say, oh, you're a Jew, you obey the law, you're a Gentile, well, you are lost. No, he doesn't say, well, you are Jews, you by the law have access, you are Gentiles, you must believe. No, he says, the law made a difference between people. I want to explain this way. We've got a very practical way in South Africa to explain this. Um, in, uh, until 1994, we had a law in our country called apartheid. Now, for those of you that are not Afrikaans speaking, the word apartheid means to be apart, apart, apart from. Apartism, if you want to call it like that. It's apartheid where we say people are not the same. There are different nations, different people inside South Africa. You would get the whites and you would get the blacks and the coloreds and the Indians and the whoever. And they would separate them. They would live in different places. Blacks weren't allowed to marry whites and vice versa. Uh, um, whites weren't allowed to live in the black area. Blacks weren't allowed to live in the white area. There was toilets for blacks and toilets for whites in the uh, pu public toilets. That's how it was. There was transport for blacks and transport, transport for whites. A black man was not uh, allowed to enter the bar, um, you know, where in, in a white area. Th that is how it was. There was apartheid. 
So there was two people. Then came a man, Nelson Mandela, and he made an end of that law, making one nation. So, without the faith of anybody, one nation was made, even if Nelson Mandela was not a president for you. You see, uh, and, and hear what I'm saying, Nelson Mandela was the president of South Africa, but he was not the president of many people. For they didn't allow him to be president in their hearts. And you would find even after that new law came that blacks wouldn't go to a bar where there's white people because that law still existed in the owner of that hotel or that pub. You don't go there. They're going to beat you up. And they wouldn't worry about the new law, for there was still a division, but in the hearts of people, although one new nation was made. And only when they made peace with and believed in the new law of no separatism and no apartheid, the freedom that came through that one man, Nelson Mandela, could be implemented in their lives and they could be really free. So without faith, you cannot even have access into that which happened to you. What has happened to all of us? To me, apartheid has been removed. It happened to me. But the law of apartheid can still live in my, in my heart and the reality about my life can still be what, is still what I believe. If a person, and there's also the story being told, that under the slavery in the 1800s, there was this, um, th this guy that had slaves on his farm. And then the slavery has been passed. There was been a, bill, a, a law passed that slavery is over. But he kept his people ignorant. So they did not believe what has happened to them or for them. And then after many years, one of the slaves heard that the slavery has been over long ago and spread that word to the other people, when they believed in the new law, they were set free. But without them believing, they are not free. Even if there is a new law. The new law doesn't make you free. The new law gives you the ability to be free if you believe it. That is what happens. Hallelujah. So we need to understand the gospel in that sense. When Jesus died, he took away the sin of the whole world and made the whole world righteous before God, even if they don't believe. Now listen to, to what I say, even if they don't believe, because there is no law in God's eyes that makes them guilty. There is no law. The only thing that can make them guilty before God is the law of life in Christ Jesus if they reject it. They'll be condemned for not accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what happens? It's like me saying there's no more speed law in our country. That means that nobody sins when it comes to speeding. Nobody. But you can find, if I don't tell that to people, and the, the signposts are still standing, 120 kilometers per hour, 60 kilometers per hour, all the signposts are still there. The law in government has been changed. You'll find people still driving and trying to keep to the limit, <coughs> the speed limit. And they'll conduct their lives according to that. But they have to hear the truth, believe the truth, for the truth to indwell them. Hallelujah. And now you might say, Bertie, but, 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 but um, you know, what is this now? Now listen, the, the word says that he's made the two people one to reconcile that man unto himself. Now the Bible says we have this ministry of reconciliation. Now let's quickly go to 2 Corinthians there, chapter 5. If this bores you today, I'm sorry, but I have to bring in some correction here today so that people will not be confused. So this is just a teaching. <clears throat> it says here, um, in, in, in verse 18, All things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Christ Jesus. So has God reconciled himself to us by Christ Jesus? He took away the law, therefore there is no separation between us and God, for there is nothing that makes us guilty before God. 
to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses against them, and has committed unto us this word of God reconciling the world unto himself. Now then you are now then we we are ambassadors for Christ, as through Christ did beseech you or plead by by us, we beg you in Christ dead, be ye reconciled to God. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now that would be some people have a problem with. It says here, we, we beg of you, be ye now reconciled with God. Saying now, realize your being. <laughs> That's not what that word says. That word doesn't say realize your being. Go read the Afrikaans translation. The Afrikaans translation, we use the word lot. Lot jou dan nou met God versoen. Because the word be in the English uh, um, has got two meanings. One of the meanings is be to say, uh, 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 to say it is in the state of being. And the other word be means let it happen to you. The word lot in Afrikaans is literally let it happen to you. Let this now happen to you. So it says from God's side, He's removed the enmity that there is. In other words, that which brought separation between you and God in this sense that you by your flesh now want to go to God has been taken away because of the weakness of your flesh. You could never reach God. So He's taken that away so that we can now come to God. How can we come to God? by knowing that we don't go through the law anymore, but through Jesus Christ. So now we come to God by faith in Christ, and we are reconciled with Him from our side. Let me explain to you this way. The Bible says that, the, that, Jesus, that there, there's a meal that God, that the, a big supper, a, a wedding feast, and God went, and, or, or the, 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 the bridegroom went, and He set out this whole meal and invited his friends. Now, the, the, the gospel that we hear these days, or that I've seen these days, is that, that it is you are already at the meal. You are seated at the meal. You are smelling the food, but the smell is foreign to you. You don't know where you are. You, you think you are busy with something else. You are, the, the, the farming you do is just an, a figure of your imagination, but the reality is you are seated at the, at the table eating the meal. And just wake up to the reality. That is not true. The, the, let me tell you what I'm telling you now. God has set the table with the body and the blood of Jesus. And we are inviting people from God's side. He says, there's nothing that disqualifies you to eat of my table. In the Old Testament, the law disqualified the Gentiles to come and eat of God's table and the Jews, for they were not able to keep to the predicament of the law. So God took the law away so that man can now come to the table where man is invited to to come and partake and sup with God. Eating the flesh of Jesus, drinking the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. And now, as ambassadors of God, we plea with you and beg with you, Paul says, to come and eat off this table. Don't say, I want to stay in works. I want to work my own field. I want to work my own work to produce food for myself. For what God then does is He will invite everybody, you know, to come, talking about the Gentiles, and then those that come to the table, they will partake. And that is the gospel. So, it is foolishness to say, well, you know, the sheep, is, the, the, the sheep that has been lost is now found. And now everybody is found. You are already back at home. Open your eyes and see where you are. That is twisting and perverting the parable, trying to say things God never said. If you are lost, my friend, you are lost. The, the Bible clearly states that people are lost. Let's go to John, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7. All people are not going to heaven. All people are not saved. Salvation has appeared 
for every person. But all people are not saved. We can also go to, to, to before I go to First John, let's go to Romans. Romans. Romans chapter 3 and verse 22. Let's read from verse 1. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Remember what I said. The righteousness of God can now be attained without the law. Even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. So what he says here is, if a Jew can believe this, he can be saved. If a Gentile can believe it, he can be saved. For there is no law anymore, there's only one man. But the one new man must now be reconciled unto God. How? And God reconciled that man unto God in this way. That he says there's no law that separates the Jew anymore because he couldn't keep the law. And there's no law that separates the Gentile anymore for the fact that he didn't have a law made that he couldn't be saved. So God took the law away so that these two people can be made one, so God doesn't see a Gentile and a Jew anymore, and the reconciliation in this person is through faith. He needs to believe and make use of this gospel. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, if by the rejecting of the law of Moses... You could be killed with three or two or three witnesses. You could be punished with death. How much sore punishment will you be count worthy of if you reject this salvation? So please, you know, uh, uh, we are not here to bring condemnation, but in the same way, uh, because of ignorance, people are lost. And if we are ignorant concerning this truth, you can also be lost. We need to believe. And you need to continue to believe until the end, my friend. You can't halfway leave the gospel, reject, go back to Judaism. You will lose your salvation. Now, I, I challenge anybody to, to come and speak to me about that. And we will just use the book of Hebrews. And if you are not stubborn in your heart, you will see that is what that, 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 that what is written there. The whole world, sin has been paid for. The whole world became a new man. In one action of Nelson Mandela, I was, made, I was made part of the rainbow nation. I was made a South African in a different way. I've been made, I've been made one nation. And there's nothing I could do about that. There's nothing that you could do about the fact that God took the law away. You can fight for the law. You can fend for the law. There's no salvation through the law. It's been taken away by God. And you are busy with something that does not exist even in the mind of God. But that does not mean that because you stand righteous before the law and righteous before God for He's taken the law away, that you, are, that you have now received the Holy Spirit. For clearly in the book of Acts, after they believed, they received the Holy Spirit. The fact that you've got a desire for God and for truth does not mean that you have God. It means you don't have God. For you to have a desire for something, you need not to have it. For me to desire an aeroplane, I don't, I, I don't, it doesn't mean I've got a plane and because I feel the passions of a plane, now I desire a plane. No. I need not to have an aeroplane, to desire an aeroplane. For you to desire God, the desire that you have for God, is not to, to say that that is now God, the sign that God lives in you. No, it is the sign that God's not in you. That is what it is. So we need to awake unto this truth. There are people out there that need to hear the gospel, that need to hear your sins has been forgiven. God has reconciled you unto Him. There's nothing that separates you from God. Or let me put it this way, when you use other words, there's nothing that makes it impossible for you to be saved now. 
All you need to do is realize that Jesus Christ paid for your sins. He died for you. He was raised on your behalf so that if you believe this and say, I identify myself with Him and make use of this and call on the name of the Lord saying, Lord, save me and believing what, what has happened, you will be saved. The Bible says, how can a man be saved unless somebody preaches to him? That makes that all people are not saved. How can a man know that he is free from slavery if he's been a slave and a new law has been passed and he doesn't have the media, he doesn't have a newspaper, he doesn't have television or anybody to tell him about this news. He'll be in slavery forevermore. And if I come and preach to him and tell him, you have been set free and he doesn't believe me, he'll be in bondage forevermore. For as long as what he doesn't have faith. And if he believes this good news and then doubts this good news that he's been set free and thinks he's a slave again, he'll go back to his slave life. And that is the way it is. Right, let's go to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 15. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 15. I want you to listen to everything I say and then to read the scriptures and, 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 and see what the scripture says. 1 John chapter 4 verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God for God is love. Verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God dwells in God and God in him. And we have known and believed the love that God has, be has for us. God is love and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. So, whosoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. Amen. Verse, chapter 5, verse 1, Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loves Him, that begat loveth Him also that is begotten of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God. So who is the children of God? Those that believe. Here, let me read again. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So, is a Muslim born of God? No. Is an atheist born of God? No. Is a Satanist born of God? No. Has all people come to the light? No. Has people rejected the light? Yes. And that is what it is. Now, let's quickly go to 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to read verse 9. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness, in other words, believes in Jesus, is not of God, neither he that loves not his brother. So here we can see he that does not do righteousness, believes in Jesus, or hates his brother, is not of God, but of the devil. <laughs> I mean, what must we do with the scripture? You, you see, that's why I say, if you go to John chapter 1, say everybody is already born of God. Why do you say here, what does it mean then? Why did John, the, the same John that wrote John chapter 1, write here, whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. Why don't you just write it plain and say, all men are born of God, just realize that you are born of God. He never wrote, there's not, not such a verse in the Bible. We must go and try and see it into scriptures and twist the thing. There are people today that are born of the seed of Satan. Jesus Christ came in John chapter 8, verse 45, around about there. Let me see, verse 44, he says, You are of your father Satan, for they found their origin in their flesh. For Satan said that I will, I will give birth to a new 
type and species which is a being that stands before God in his own works. So, God came. Adam stood guiltless before God, for there was no law. Jesus Christ came, took away the sin of the world, made that people stood guiltless before God because he took the law away. But your belief determines where you stand. Like Adam's belief determined where he was standing. When he believed in his flesh, do you know what happened? He died. In the same way, if you believe, if he believed God and ate of the tree of, the, of, of life, he would have lived forevermore. But now, he didn't. In the same way, you need to believe on Jesus. Without having faith in Jesus Christ, my friend, there is simply nothing for you. Let's go to um, uh, 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 Romans chapter 5. Romans cha Romans. Chapter 4. If you go and read the book of Romans, man, people, you will not believe it. But here you can see this page is not here anymore. <laughs> so I can't read that. I can't read that verse. Uh, sorry, that was Romans 6. Sorry, I've got, I've got Romans 5. Here it is. <laughs> it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. We are justified by faith. That's why I believe the scripture says that he died because, or he was resurrected because of our justification. Should also read for our justification. He was raised so that we can believe and be justified. Amen. If he was raised because of our justification, all we can say is that God said that the law truly has been fulfilled. And concerning the law, we are justified. But are you justified concerning your faith? Because there's a law of faith. Are you justified concerning faith? Or, stand, or are you standing guilty before God concerning your faith in Jesus Christ? Are you righteous before God when it comes to accepting Jesus? Or are you guilty in, when it comes to the sacrifice of Jesus? You rejecting the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 4. I mean, the whole of Romans, if you go read from verse 2, is all about faith. This gospel, like I said in Romans 3 here, it says... Even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus. So here we, many people say, you know, Romans chapter 5 talks about the faith of Jesus. Therefore being justified by faith. Whose faith? The faith of Jesus. No, no, listen. Let's read chapter 3 and see the context. It says here, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all of them that believe. So there is, by the faith of Jesus, the law was fulfilled by the faith he had. The law was fulfilled and the way was made. And by our faith, we've got access into this. In the Old Testament, there was righteousness in heaven. There was the law. The law, then by obedience to the law, belief and obedience in the law, we had access to God. God came, took that law away, placed Jesus Christ there in human form, and then said, now by faith in Jesus Christ and obedience to Christ, we have got access into this holiness. And how do we obey Jesus? Romans chapter 6, the, 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 um, the, the piece that I don't have there. Let's see. Maybe it is in the, in the part that I'm looking for. Verse 13. It, it is gone here. But what it says there in Romans 6 is that we have obeyed, we are saved for we have obeyed this form of doctrine. We have obeyed this form of doctrine. Because we've obeyed the correct form of doctrine, we are now enslaved unto righteousness. You need to be obedient to Jesus. And His command is, believe upon me. There is still a law. That law is faith in Jesus, which is not accessed by our human efforts, which is accessed by the prompting of the Spirit inside us, that by the power that comes through this word, when we believe it, then everything that Jesus has done becomes active in our lives. But not before that. Right. Now let, let's read verse chapter 4. Um, it says, What shall we say then? That Abraham our father has pertained to the flesh as found? 
In other words, that Abraham by his works, was he counted righteous? For if Abraham were justified by works, he has wherefore to glory, but not before God. For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So here is the whole thing, the whole book of Romans. You believe, and what Christ has done will be accounted to you. You believe, and will be accounted to you. It's not, it's accounted to you, and you don't believe it. Please wake up and read the Bible. Amen. Now to him that worketh, worketh, Work of the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believes on him, that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David. So what has happened? God took away the law. By taking away the law, we can, we, he justifies the ungodly that does what? That believes. Amen. Saying, blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are Blesses the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in the circumcision or in the uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith. being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all of them that believe. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them all, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of the faith, of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. So what does it say here? It clearly states that we have to believe and once you believe, this comes. So was Abraham reckoned righteous and then and God blessed him because God already reckoned him righteous and because God already reckoned him righteous and just God came to him and blessed him? No, no, no. God came and spoke well over a sinner and said, this I promise you. And I want to say this to you. The promise of God to all the world is, I will give you immortality. I will make you holy. I will, and, and the, the greatest promise actually is, I will give you the Holy Spirit and I will make you immortal. That is the promise that remains. That is to every person in the world. And then if he can believe what God has done, in order for him to have that in the return of Jesus and the Holy Spirit right now, it will be accounted to him for righteousness and then that which God promised will be given to him. He'll receive the Holy Spirit which is the seal and the sign that he is saved and will be saved in the day of judgment. Amen. Go and study the scriptures for yourself. I don't have... Just what I said there will take five sessions to explain it to you, but that is what the scripture says. Right, I wanted to read something in Romans 7. My Romans 7 is gone. <laughs> Man, can you believe that? So, Romans chapter 7 verse 1 to 5 says that God came, th that we are married to the law, as long as what the law lives. But Jesus Christ came and died as a man under the law. When he died as a man under the law, what happened? There is no more law man, so that we might be married to Jesus and bring forth much fruit. How are we married to Christ? Through faith. Belief. Call upon the name of Jesus. It's, it's clear in Romans chapter 10. Let's just read it there. People, I've read so many scriptures, there cannot be any argument anymore. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, so is everybody saved? No. Is everybody born again? No. Who is born again? Those that believe upon his name are born of God. Right. How then shall they call on the name if, in whom they have not believed? 
How shall they believe in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet that bring this good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. So hear what, hear what it says. They have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So what is obedience to the new command? So that you can be saved? It is belief. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So how are they saved if they cannot believe? How can they believe if they cannot hear? What is this word? I've taken away the law. I've made one new man. You are not guilty according to the law anymore because I've removed the thing that makes you guilty where you get justification by your works and I've made another way by which you can be justified which is the body of Jesus that obeyed on your behalf. You've got access into this by faith when you believe and call upon the name of the Lord, you will receive the Holy Spirit. Once you've received the Holy Spirit, that is the seal and the sign that you are a child of God. The Bible says, how do we know that we are children of God? That He's given us His Holy Spirit. Are there people that don't have the Holy Spirit? Oh yes. If you can see how they get it, it means that there are people that don't have it. End of the story. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. There's another scripture that I would have loved to read. You go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 4. Now listen to this. Listen to this. Um, it says here in verse 21, Tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it's written, Abraham had two sons, the one by the bond, bondmaid and the other by the free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which genders to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answers to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. So it speaks about Jerusalem, which believes in the law and gives birth to people. Je Jesus said, he says, to the Pharisees that preach the law. He says, you go over land and sea to make one disciple. Then you make him twi twice as much a son or an offspring of hell as what you are yourself. Saying that they originate and who they are is out of hell. Now, these are people made by God, belonging to God. And the life that's inside them originates and is born out of hell. So, Jesus said, and let me tell you something, the fact that God made you doesn't mean you are saved. God also made Satan. God made those that crucified Jesus. God made the demons. They were angels, became demons. God made them all. The fact that you make something doesn't mean it's saved. The, the prodigal son, the fact that he was a son, didn't mean that he was saved. The fact that it means that God, the, the origin of his creation, he was created by God, doesn't mean he's saved. It means that something created by God, that belongs to God, was lost. And all the consequences of being lost would have been his. One day a man said to me, but Bert, you must realize that prodigal son would have inherited. If the father died, even if he was lost, his inheritance would have been sent to him. No, my friend, the Bible says he received in his, his inheritance before the time and went and squandered it. So, God came and gives us an inheritance. He gives us his son. And says, through his son, the whole world has got access into this. And through Jesus, we inherit it is, this is our inheritance, Jesus. What are you going to do with your inheritance? Are you going to take your inheritance and make a law out of that in the sense of getting back under the law? Are you going to say, well, are you going to believe in that or not? What are you going to do? Are you going to squander your inheritance and go to hell and be lost? No, I want to declare to you today that God came to save you. He came to give you a gospel that you can believe in Him. Hallelujah. Here it says that Jerusalem with her children is in bondage. So there is children out of the law. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of 
us all. Now, that all there, does that mean all in the sense of every human being? No, it does not, because it also states that there are children now that are born out of the law, and then there are children which is of another mother. So it talks about the children here that's of the mother which is from above. Which is whom? Which is those that believe? For it's written, Rejoice, you barren that bears not. Break forth, cry and singing. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. So, there are those that are born after the flesh, and there are those that are born after the Spirit. Who's born after the flesh? Those that believe in the law and reject Jesus. Who's born after the Spirit? Those that believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. John chapter 1 verse 5. Those that believe are born of God. Amen. Nevertheless, what says the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son shall of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. The heir there speaks of something we shall still inherit, which is immortality. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Talking about the believers. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, thank you that people will understand this. Amen. I want to say this, that I will make a point of ministering on this until people do understand this. Thank you for that, my God. It's important that people believe. Hallelujah. I am against the doctrine of ultimate reconciliation, and I want you to know that. I hate that doctrine, because through that doctrine, many people will go to hell, for it's not the truth. The fact that you believe something doesn't make it the truth. You can do nothing against the truth. Even if you say all people are saved, if you don't want to quote five scriptures that all people are saved, it doesn't make all people saved. So you can do nothing against the truth. I don't have to fend for the truth. The truth is all people are not saved. The truth is that all people are not born again. The truth is that people need to hear the word of the gospel, believe on Jesus, so that the Spirit can give birth to a new life inside them and they can be born of God in such a way, making an end to the flesh life they live and be holy and blameless before God. Thank you for the good news, Jesus. Amen. Thank you that you've listened to this. If you've got any questions, please send it to Pastor Berti at dynamicministries.com and we will answer your question. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your support. God is such a good God. Amen.